Good morning from Nairobi. I hope that you are all doing fine and thank you for joining us this morning um, for the webinar on trademarks and domain name disputes. We are really excited to be having you here today. Um, our speakers are ready uh, to go and so I just want to welcome you this morning to the webinar that is co-organized by Lawyers Hub, ICANN, AFTLD, together with Kenick. Um, we're very happy that you could join us from wherever you are at, and we want to just find out, you know, who's joining us today in the room. Um, so feel free to use the chat option. Please let us know who's who's joining in. I'm seeing Bob Ocheng from ICANN. Thank you so much for joining us, Bob, and making this, you know, um, webinar possible. Um, I also would want to um, welcome the team. If you are just joining us, please type to all panelists and all attendees. Don't just type to panelists, but you know, type to all panelists and attendees so that we could all read your messages. If you have a question, please do not put it in the chat, put it in the Q&A section. Um, that way it will be easy to, you know, um, to get it going. I see we have Grace Ingabire, um, I believe from Rwanda. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Rizike Mukole from um, the Law Society uh, in Mombasa. Barak Otieno, thank you for making this webinar to happen. Uh, we also have Wafa Dahmani, FTLD in Tunisia. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Victor Sang, thank you for joining us. I see Joa Misi as well, who is an IP practitioner. Um, thanks for joining us. Mboi Misati from Kipi. Um, thank you so much for joining us as well. Caroline Kiambi, uh, Joan Kenya from Sasa Host. Uh, thanks for joining us. And Caroline, um, <laughs> thank you. I'm sort of losing my track. Ivo Dongo from Mombasa. Thank you, Humphrey from Santec Solutions. Uh, Brian Joseph from Root Africa. Thank you, Wafula from Kenik. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we also have Lilian Olivia from Ada Labs Africa. Thank you for joining us. The Afrinic team. Uh, thank you, David Njuki for joining. Martin Sydney, uh, thanks so much. And you're looking forward to learning. Kelvin from Deep Africa and Simba and Simba Advocates. We have Perpetua. We have Andrew Baruhi from CRB in Kenya and Patience Kokunda. Thank you so much for joining us as well. Um, if you are on social media, we also want to invite you to continue to tag us in tweets. Um, our team will be putting in the list um, of people and the speakers and their Twitter handles. Um, so please feel free to engage. Gabriel from Nairobi from Propident Technologies, thanks for joining us. And John Gather is saying, hey, yeah, folks, um, hey, yeah. Omotola from uh, Nigeria, Wogo Host Nigeria, thanks so much for joining us. Mysterious from Director, Direct Core Technologies as well. Thank you for joining us so much, everyone. And we really appreciate your, your support as well. Um, if I didn't mention your name, just know that there's a lot of um, messages going on in the chat, uh, but we're really happy that you could join us as well this particular morning. Um, just use the Q&A tab if you have any questions, any expectations, uh, please feel free to let us know. Do we have uh, the poll question ready? Um, okay. Uh, we have Liz .net, um, Liz Ndungu from uh, .net Africa. Um, we have Hagriv Standard from Sasa Host as well. Um, thanks to Sasa Host, we see, you know, um, the support as well. We really, really appreciate that. Um, I just have the first poll question ready. And we want to ask, um, are you from the legal uh, sector or you, um, are you from the non-legal sector? So a poll will appear on your screen. Please just vote to let us know so that we will be able to customize our content um, in accordance to who we have in the room. Um, Thank you very much. You have a few seconds to vote. 65% of you have voted. Um, a few of you have not voted. So please uh, vote and let us know. I'll give you two seconds as I just click a button on my screen. 81% of you have voted. Let's see how this goes. Uh, okay. Yes, our final poll is out. And if you could share the poll, uh, the poll results, we have legal is 56% and we have non-legal 44%. Um, thank you very much. And so we know there's both lawyers and people from the tech ecosystem in our, um, in our uh, you know, webinar today. Uh, thank you very much. And then we go to the poll, second poll question. We'd love to know, are you joining us from Kenya or from the other countries? Are you joining us from Kenya or any other African country? Uh, please feel free to vote. I'll give you another two or three seconds. Okay. We have 81% of you have voted. And I think 
we can wrap up the poll. Thank you very much. Um, we have 84% of you joining us from Kenya. Um, and we have 16% joining us from the rest of Africa. Um, thank you very much. And Faith Simui is joining us from, I think, London. And she's like, you know, <laughs> what's this poll about? But thank you very much for, for joining us. If we didn't cover you in the poll also, let us know on the chat. Let us know exactly what, you know, um, where you are from if you are not included in this particular poll. Feel free to continue to interact on the chat and let us know um, exactly where you're joining in from, what your career, um, you know, means Watagi is joining us from Germany, but he's Kenyan. Um, thank you very much for joining us. And so today we are really um, happy to be beginning this discussion, the discussion around trademarks and brand protection, and also looking at, you know, domains in, in that particular regard. Um, we'd want to, you know, begin from here, but I'd want to just have a quick um, you know, um, introduction from um, our partners who put together this uh, particular discussion. We have Barack Otieno. Um, we also have um, Bobo Chieng. Um, I'm not sure that the, they are on the panel yet, uh, but I believe in a few minutes we'll be able to get them on, on, on the panel. Uh, but our first speaker um, today is Daniel Greenberg. Um, he's a director at Lex Synergy. He is the CEO and founder of Lex Synergy. They are an ICANN accredited registrar and online brand company. He's a qualified UK solicitor and South African attorney specializing in domain recovery and has filed domain complaints in India, South Africa, US, New Zealand, China, um, within the EU and also UK. Uh, Daniel is a member of the International Trademarks Association Internet Committee. He is also the co-author of the textbook Cyber Law uh, and he also has been published in several intellectual property law journals. So I would like, want us to just put together our digital fingers and give a clap to Daniel as he comes on stage. Daniel? Great. Uh, to say thank you for that uh, nice in introduction. Uh, I think you left out the most important part is that we're a KNIC registrar, which is uh, very important for the um, community that's here today. It's nice to see a, a lot of lawyers joining. Um, I'll, I'll try to keep it as, as simple as possible. Um, being a lawyer myself, I'm, I'm an admitted South African attorney and UK solicitor. Um, so we, we deal mainly in, in African domain names and complex areas. And I think it's very important for startups and for other types of businesses to understand how they can go about protecting their brand online. So I'll just go through my slides a little bit about like Synergy. Like I said, uh, we're a KNIC registrar. We're also ICANN accredited. We're one of the most accredited registrars in Africa. So we help a lot of big brands, law firms, secure domain names within Africa and around the world. Also, we have an online brand protection team. So we move a, a, remove a lot of infringements from the internet. So um, we um, take down websites, we recover a lot of domain names. And um, basically if it's online, we come in there to, to take it offline. So ju jumping right into um, um, brand protection, it's very important to see where we were and wh where we are now is a few months ago, or actually a year now, we used to do, do a lot of things in the real world. We used to eat out, we used to buy groceries, we used to go to the movies, go to the bank, we used to work. Um, and our world has been changed overnight. Now we do everything online. A lot of these brands are European centric. So now you do Uber Eats, you order your clothing online, you, you do a lot more social media, banking online. In the UK, you have a virtual doctor, you can um, have a doctor's consultation through Skype, and uh, you can exercise uh, via you know, home exercise equipment. So, so the world has changed significantly. So what has that done um, for the space it's in itself, the online space? A lot of lawyers, um, tend to, uh, or IP lawyers tend to ignore um, the online space, especially domain names. They're, they're really seen um, as an afterthought, but I think that's changing now with the, um, with the online space and the way we interact online. So traditionally what a, a trademark is, it's, it's a sign that, or any sign that distinguishes your products or services from someone else's. So you wanna make sure that if someone sees your product, they know that it's yours. What that means is, for instance, um, Apple, very good trademark, we all know it. Um, you pay a lot of money for this uh, particular brand. 
it's a very good trademark for technology because it's not really associated with that uh, with the technology industry. So it's very distinctive. So it's distinguishing your brands from someone else's. Apple um, for a green grocer or a uh, vegetable store is not the best thing because it's required in the trade. Everyone uses it, so it won't be able to distinguish your products from someone else's. So there are a lot of good marks out there like Google um, that really don't mean much, but over the years uh, we've, we've become and uh, well-known with this particular brand. So jumping into how do I protect my brand online? And I know there are a lot of lawyers on, uh, on here. Some may agree with the approach, some may disagree. So I do welcome a, a lot of questions surrounding this is that a lot of businesses don't have the financial resources to protect their particular brand as a trademark in the beginning. I would advise that you do file a trademark for any brand that you have. But I would say the most or the easiest part is just do a simple Google search. So what does that mean? Just search Google, type in the name that you want to use, see who's using it locally and internationally. Just remember there are no borders within the internet. So you want to make sure that your brand is not conflicting with someone else's. Sometimes a person comes up with a brand a brand, and they fall in love with their own brand. And, and that can be very dangerous. It's almost like having a, a child that, that misbehaves. It's your child, so you don't see the flaws, but people in the restaurant will see this child performing and they are more aware of it. So try not to fall in, in love with your brand at the early stages, make sure that you can protect it. So what we would do is advise conducting a Google search, seeing what's out there. If results come back and it looks like the market is flooded with that name, come up with a different name. Rather change it in the early stages than later on when you, see, when you receive a cease and desist or a letter of demand from lawyers around the world or someone who you're stepping um, uh, on their toes, you want to make sure that you have at least protected that. And that's, and that's a practical way. Just make sure that you've done a Google search. After that, we'd suggest securing domain names. Domain names are relatively cost effective when you compare it to other forms of protection. So if you're in Kenya, you'd uh, register co.ke, .ke, info.ke. And I know Kenya's got a lot of um, second level um, domains that you can secure your domains in. So you'd go and see which ones are relevant to you. Then I would look at Dot Africa. I know we've got uh, Neil here from uh, who has been heavily involved in Dot Africa. That's a very good extension where it covers the entire continent. Sometimes it can be quite costly securing domain names in certain African countries just because of the pricing model that some registry operators have. So at least Africa is like kind of the catch-all. So if you're branching off into various different countries, .africa is the one. .com is still king, so you need a .com. I often say if you can't get the .com, consider changing your name or coming up with a domain name that you can use within the com space. And within that, choose one that is relatively short. Don't choose a um, domain name that is the plumbers in Nairobi 247365services.com. It must be short, sweet, and a person must be able to remember it. There are also a lot of generic domains. So like Synergy, we register over domains in over a thousand extensions. So it's quite a quite a number. And there are some that are relevant to your um, industry. So if you're in technology, it would be dot tech, dot technology. Um, and, and there's so many different others, dot business, dot venture. So look which ones are relevant to you and secure your particular mark in those areas. Then the next most important thing is secure your social media names. You know, the minute your brand is announced, people try and jump on it as quickly as possible. Make sure you get a, a suitable social media name. So if it's Twitter, Facebook, get the forward slash at your name. So it's forward slash, say Coca-Cola, forward slash, um, whatever your particular uh, brand is. Make sure that you secure that at the very early stages. Then once you've secured all the um, online um, um, uh, services, such as a domain name or, um, or social media, you can look at your trademark. If there's an issue with the trademark, you can always re-register domain names and it, it's rather, it, it's easier doing, that, uh, doing it that way. What often happens is a lot of entrepreneurs spend a lot of money with trademark lawyers securing their brand they spend a lot of money securing it locally because trademarks, you can only protect territorially. So that means if you um, have a trademark in Kenya, you're only protected in Kenya. So then you have to go to each country where you, where you want protection and you need to, to secure it in, in that country. 
So it becomes very costly. And then all of a sudden you spend thousands and thousands of dollars. And then you realize you can't get the .com, you can't get the .ke, you can't get the social media handle so, or a username. So then what's the real point? So make sure you secure those first and then you go after the trademark. So the trademark, you file, like I said, in the various um, countries. Also register a company name. In most countries, there's no um, cross-referencing between the company's office and the trademark's office. So you should make sure that you get a name that is suitable. And once you've secured a name within uh, a particular country or as a trademark, make sure that you monitor it because some people may start uh, to step on your toes and using confusingly similar names and you want to enforce your rights. And that's where your trademark comes in handy. So if you ever have a domain name dispute, which um, I'm sure other panelists will discuss, you need to rely on a trademark. You can rely on a common law trademark, that's an unregistered mark, but it's more difficult. And uh, you rather want to wave this lovely certificate around showing that you, you have some registered rights, which does um, enhance your chances of winning um, in a domain name complaint. But I cannot stress how important it is. Our, our business, uh, fortunately, over the last year, has picked up where a lot of businesses have had to make the shift from the online space to the um, sorry to the offline space to the online space, and that takes a lot of effort. And uh, it's so easy to be diverted to a phishing site or a competitor site. I always compare it to the bricks and mortar world. If you're trying to walk into a certain shop, and as you're walking into this branded shop, someone shoulder barges you and pushes you into another store and you buy similar products and services. You may be none the wiser, but what happens is you're buying someone else's product. So it's very important that you um, secure um, your rights um, online as early as possible. I did put a few parodies, as you can see in there, enjoy your choke and um, oops for a UPS. It's, um, these are obviously well-known brands that, that people have kind of um, used as parody. And the more popular your business becomes, the more it can be targeted online. So these steps, these five steps that I've laid out, and I've gone through it quite quickly because I know time is of the essence and I'd rather handle questions. Um, this or these five steps should enable you at least cost effectively to make sure that you've protected um, your brand at least locally. And once it's picked up, you can look at extending it to, to other countries. So with that, that was um, brand protection in a nutshell. I know it was quite quick and you may have a lot of questions. So um, if there are questions, I, know, uh, I don't know if we're handling them uh, at this early point or whether it's going to be um, at the end of the session. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, that, that was a good um, presentation on how to protect your brand. And I think there's been discussions, especially between the the legal sector and the tech sector. For a lawyer, the moment you get an idea, you quickly run to the registry and register a company and hope that a company name gives you that particular protection. And that's what we tell our clients. Uh, but then for the people in the tech world, uh, we own domains. Um, I personally own like 200 domains that wow. um, I, I don't know what I'm going to do with them. I, I leave nothing for my children but domain names. Uh, <laughs> so we feel like, like a domain is you know, ultimate ownership, you know? Yes. Um, so is it the chicken or the egg? Um, and that's a question, what comes first? Do I focus on the domain um, or do I focus on actually the trademark? Um, what would your answer be in that case? I, I think it's both. You can't ignore, it's not one or the other, but what I would do is I would secure the domain names first, then conduct a trademark search. If it's available, then file for the, file the particular trademark because domain names are relatively cheap. You know, you can register a domain name for maybe $10, $15. Um, so, you know, a trademark can co cost you a couple of hundred. And what's the point of having this nice trademark when you when you just can't use it online? So that's, that's, that's a pressure. That's okay. yeah. Thank you very much, Daniel. And if you have any questions for Daniel, please use the, uh, the Q&A tab on your screen. Uh, don't post questions on the chat because we'll sort of lose sight of them. Um, if you have a comment, if you want to network, you want to let us know where you're joining in from, what your practice is. I see also people who sell um, domains here and resellers. Please feel free to post on the, um, on the chat and let us know what you do and where you're joining in us from. If you're on Twitter, we posted the, um, sorry, not the domains, but the, 
Um, you can tag, you can use our hashtag, please it's on the chat, feel free to use it and interact with people on those particular platforms. Um, we are Lawyers Hub Kenya um, on all the platforms. If you're on LinkedIn, we have a group that talks about law and technology. And so find Africa Law Tech on LinkedIn and join the group. And thanks Joyce Kirunga from Uganda for and joining Linda. us as well. Yes, yes, Daniel. So, so, uh, sorry, I just wanted to add, I just saw a, a question pop up. It was actually in the, um, in the chat where someone said, isn't Google generic? And I just thought it was a very good question. Um, yeah. Because I did use Google as an example. Uh, the Google is at risk of becoming um, generic. And that's a, a bit of a concern for companies like that, where your mark is distinctive. But then what happens is over time, people use it as a way of describing your service. So you can say to someone, let me go home and Google it. But what will you do? You'll, you'll open Yahoo. And then you would search in your time Googling it. So it becomes a descriptive term for the actual service itself, like escalator, elevator, were trademarks at one stage, and now they've become generic because there's no other way of describing that particular product. So I just thought I'd answer that question. It may help that person out. Yeah. Thanks, Daniel. That sounds like Zoom. People now say Zoom it. Um, yeah, yes, Zoom. exactly. Yeah. And we're okay. we on Microsoft, we're on mute, uh, with the Teams now. That's true. Or, okay. Is, is there are in Teams, I think, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Daniel. And now we go to our second speaker. Um, and our second speaker is Neil uh, Dundas. He's an African born and raised entrepreneur, lawyer in Teki. He is the co-founder and CEO of Domain Name Services Limited, which provides technical registry services and infrastructure to the .za domain. Um, he is also the co-founder and director of DNS Africa Limited, which is also an ICANN accredited registrar and registry service provider based in Mauritius. Um, DNS Africa develops, maintains, and supports its own range of domain name-related products, services, and technologies. Uh, his work before um, he's also been involved with securing the support of the African Union Commission and other key stakeholders to facilitate the ZACR's application and launch of the Dot Africa top level domain through ICANN's 2012 um, application round. He's a qualified attorney, a previous partner with the law firm Bowman's, um, and through his work as an intellectual property attorney in South Africa, he's worked a lot within the particular sector. He's also a finalist in the 2012 South African IT Personality of the Year, IT Web. Uh, he's quite donned. I have summarized his CV and I hope that his bio and I hope that I didn't do, you know, um, any crime and any sin to him. But Neil, the floor is yours. Please proceed. Well, thank you for that introduction. I... Um... Uh, when I was listening to it, I was saying, well, who are you talking about? This doesn't sound like me, but uh, <laughs> I've come a long way in 20 or so years that I've been involved in this industry. So um, it's quite refreshing to look back and see sort of the progress we've made over the last few years. I want to speak to you today, um, sorry, just briefly about myself other than the CV is that um, I have sort of moved generally out of the legal practice environment where I was very involved with uh, online trademark protection and intellectual property protection. Um, that was sort of my area of expertise and speciality. Daniel and myself worked together for a few years. Um, I then moved out of that environment into the tech space and uh, co-founded a company that really is looking more at the infrastructure development part of the internet, as opposed to really getting involved in the day-to-day -day, um, legal practice sort of areas. Um, but it, because of my, uh, my uh, involvement in the, in the legal uh, fraternity in South Africa in particular, um, and I'm looking back at it, I can certainly see certain things that we put in place in the very beginning stages as the domain space and domain names in particular were growing in popularity, how we put certain things in place uh, to look at and to protect uh, rights protection issues such as trademark, um, trademark protection. Um, and that really, what I, what, I, what I see looking back is that a lot of those issues originated from the legal practice side and were driven into the tech side. So the origins of a lot of the remedies out there and the, um, and the channels available for rights protection really uh, in our industry at least or in our uh, part of the world emanated from the legal fraternity. And I would encourage legal practitioners in Kenya to be at the forefront of what they need and defining uh, what sort of processes they need and in championing those and making sure that the technical community uh, and the business community is able to, to take up a lot of the, uh, the issues that are, that are raised and identified. 
from our perspective, and I'm going to talk specifically about .za, which is the South African country code domain, like .ke is for Kenya. Uh, in, in South Africa, we have uh, a, con a commercial namespace within ZA called CO.ZA, and uh, that's now approaching about 1.3 million names. Um, and the net result of that is that that namespace has become sort of a de facto standard when it comes to online presence, very much like .com is a, is a standard in the US and .uk in, in the United Kingdom and KE in Kenya. Uh, .co.za is very, very popular um, and, uh, and it's very prevalent in trade and industry. So you tend to see it wherever you go. And it, and it um, makes Daniel's point about maybe grabbing the domain name first a little, uh, a little bit more pertinent because, uh, because the domain space is, is so out in the open and so accessible and so visible, uh, you certainly don't want to miss the boat when it comes to securing your brand for the first time. And in, in all likelihood, it would make a lot of sense to grab your co.za or co.ke first and then look at how you can um, secure that right um, down the line by, by registering a trademark. But in the, in the ZA namespace, um, as that namespace was growing, um, there was this, there was from an infrastructure and a development perspective, there was this concern that we weren't going to, we were, we were basically enabling a lawless namespace. So a namespace that didn't have the necessary mechanisms in place to allow trademark holders to protect their rights. And it was becoming a lawless, a bit of a lawless environment where there was, quite a bit of cyber squatting or trademark infringement or, or, or brand uh, violations. And there wasn't a reasonable means for trademark owners um, uh, and law enforcement and the like to, to actually take remedial action against those abuses. So in, in roughly about 2005 to 2007, um, and this was spearheaded from the legal fraternity, uh, I was uh, directly a part of that. Uh, we started petitioning uh, the registry and the Department of Communications in South Africa to establish an alternate dispute resolution process for the namespace. And long story short, we were able to implement that process from 2007. So it was in uh, it was uh, in uh, documented into regulations, which is I think uh, a relatively novel uh, process worldwide. I think ADR processes are normally very con contractual, but in South Africa they were actually introduced by law, by, by regulations. And from 2007 till today, uh, there is a constant stream of IP attorneys in particular that are using the mechanism to challenge domain name registrations out there on the basis that they're abusive uh, and are infringing some uh, one of their clients' rights. So what I wanna quickly show you some brief statistics around how that ADR process has evolved in terms of stats. Uh, let me just see if I can flick over to the, let's see, there we go. So since the beginning, since 2007, there was a gradual increase of the number of cases that were filed using the ADR regulations, uh, and these were predominantly focused around the CO.ZA namespace. And you can see from the trend line on that, on that uh, slide that generally the trend line was going up. There were more and more cases being filed every single year, although the last two years have sort of bucked that trend a little bit, and we've had less cases filed um, in 2019 and 2020. But generally, it has been a story of increasing popularity where there are not huge, huge amounts of ADR matters being filed, but they were steadily increasing. And a lot of the names that were being, were, with the focus of these ADR cases, were very prominent, uh, high value names, very well known marks in, in trade and industry. So if you look at it in terms of domain names itself, um, while the cases might have been slightly lower, they normally involve multiple domain names. So on average, we were, I think we were looking at about 1.3 names per every case. Last year, for, in, for example, there were 25 cases that were filed involving 37 domain names. So again, not huge amounts of, um, of cases that were being filed, but still a significant amount for the South African environment. And uh, it just goes to show that a lot of the, um, the IP firms or the trademark attorneys out there using this process um, are act, actually actively using this process in order to resolve certain uh, disputes on behalf of their clients. Um, and it continues even in, in within this year, I think we're up to about 10 cases so far. Um, and interesting, if you look at some of the outcomes of these cases, um, in the vast majority of these cases, the, the, the matters actually proceed to decision. And in most of those decision, uh, in those cases, the, um, the cases are decided either for the complainant or against the complainant. 
um, and very few cases are actually settled at this stage. There are some, but generally, when cases get to an ADR process, they tend to uh, they tend to go through the full process and, and end up in a decision. There are a few um, matters here and there that are settled, but generally, um, we believe that a lot of the settlement negotiations um, sort of gets worked out in the informal mediation process or in the in the pre-litigation stages of a domain and when you're putting people on terms and you, you, may, you may be settled a lot of matters that way. But once the ADR process starts, it inevitably drives through to an, a final decision. Um, and then interestingly enough, the stat, and I think it's predictable and it's reflected worldwide in any ADR process is that the majority of cases that are filed are, um, are decided in favor of the complainant. So the complainant tends to be successful in most of these instances and uh, what's even more interesting is that in the South African environment, at least a lot of complaints are filed via legal counsel. So this is maybe a lesson. It's, a, it's definitely developed as a practice area, a specialized practice area amongst trademark practitioners in South Africa. And I, and I, I believe the world, there are now specialist trademark practitioners. I think Daniel can count himself as one of those, but there are many, many out there in terms of the legal profession that have made a speciality out of this particular area, not just filing in their country, but filing uh, disputes for GTLDs with ICANN and the World Intellectual Property Organization. And you find that they're actually developing um, a good sense of how to develop work in the, in the, in the, in the domain and dispute resolution environment, and then how to pursue this work to filing these disputes on behalf of their clients. Um, and I've met quite a few um, in, uh, lawyers in, who are uh, based all around the world that have made this an area of expertise within their practice. Um, and then just the last step from my side on this, on this issue is that it's strange enough that a lot of the, um, um, a lot of the domain name dispute matters that are filed actually go unopposed. And I think that's a stat that is borne out by the UDRP uh, cases as well. I'm not 100% sure, but what we found in South Africa is that a lot of cases that were filed, um, there is actually no response received from the registrant. So it tends, it tends to be an indication of some nefarious activity or maliciousness potentially, um, in that the registrant doesn't really want to defend um, the claim to the domain name, but they still force the complainant to go through the whole process of filing a dispute and the cost and all of that. So the vast majority of cases are unopposed as well as that the vast majority of the cases actually go through towards a decision in favor of the complainant. Um, the downside of, well, the upside of this whole ADR process is, is that it has de developed a, um, a, a fairly efficient and cost-effective mechanism to challenge domain names in a particular country. But the downside is that um, there's no a consequence on the domain name registrant in terms of cost, uh, cost orders or anything like that. So what tends to happen is they force the complainant into a process to complete the process from start to finish uh, without putting up any major defense or opposition. Uh, and that just makes the complainant have to incur the, the costs and the time of actually going through an ADR process. But the only solution other than this was to go through a legal or litigation process. And that was even more costly and time consuming in the past. So I think from a development perspective, any um, growing and successful namespace uh, in Africa and around the world has to have some sort of dispute resolution, alternative dispute resolution process to cater for those rights protection issues that do arise. And in doing that, you're creating fertile ground to develop the legal fraternity in terms of developing this as a specialist area within their practices. And like I said, we've seen that uh, quite extensively in our part of the world in, in South Africa. Uh, and uh, we sure that 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 will be the same case, the same result anywhere else where you have an ADR process and a growing namespace on which it is based. Um, and then lastly, from my side, but because I know time is of the essence, um, it's just on the other side of the ADR process. So the ADR process was coincidentally or ironically brought in at a time when access to registry information through who is who is information was relatively open and easily accessible. Uh, and and in, the, in those environments, we we introduced an, an alternate dispute resolution process for domain disputes, um, and that is because legal practitioners out there had access to all the registry information. They could identify these abuses or potential abuses, and then they could take action against those abuses using the ADR mechanism. Ironically, what's happened is sub subsequent to us introducing these ADR mechanisms, uh, the protection of personal information regulations and laws and policies globally have restricted access 
to personal information, in, in particular domain registry information. So it's become a lot more difficult to identify abusive registrations out there and for um, people to make use of the uh, ADR mechanisms and to pursue uh, the enforcement of their rights. So from our perspective, I see an, another era of development when it comes to the infrastructure around domain names, and that has to be towards um, not circumventing, but sort of catering for the limitations that have been placed on um, rights protection uh, uh, agencies and firms such as intellectual property lawyers and trademark attorneys, placing them in a position where they can again relatively easily identify these abusive practices and then take action on behalf of their clients. And from what my perspective, I see uh, ways in which this can happen is through generating additional services. So this is the registry generating additional services to allow for watch services uh, in their namespace. And this could be aggregated through, uh, these services could be aggregated through a company like Alex Synergy as an example that does that, that offers that service across multiple namespaces. But I think what we need to do is we need to see registries provide more reasonable gated access to the registry data so that these abuses can be identified. I think that will be the next stage or the next phase in the domain registry environment where these type of value added services are added in and potentially allowing um, uh, registrars or even uh, rights, in, uh, rights enforcement agencies like, you know, like trademark firms to, to, to insert or to list certain names that they want watched. So if, an, if a domain name is registered, it incorporates a search phrase um, that, that a notification is then sent to that firm to say, a new domain name has been registered that now incorporates uh, the name that you wanted or that you have listed that you wanted watched. I see that as a, as, a, as a potential development that is coming in the future because what you have with IP firms in general, this is my last statement on this, is that you tend to generate work for your firm, for your company, for your practice by looking at the trademark, um, uh, uh, the trademark list at the end of each month or the end of each year, looking at what trademarks and business names and company names have been registered. And then you generate a conflict list from that that you now generate work on. You can't really do that when it comes to domain names because there's no list that is published every month about what new domain names have been registered. So I think it's important for, for domain registries to bring that publication, that awareness into the public space and to provide a mechanism for uh, trademark attorneys and practitioners to actually be able to identify these infringing practices and then take the corrective action against them. So I see that as something that is certainly going to um, uh, evolve in the, in the coming months and years. And then also um, the other aspect would be to provide more detailed information around registry data. So at the moment, uh, I'm not sure how it is in Kenya, but in South Africa in particular, the WHOIS information is largely being redacted and it's relatively useless when it comes to um, identifying who's behind an infringing domain registration. So that process also needs to evolve that we can see uh, if there is an infringing domain name that has come about that we can actually get the relevant registry information in order to take action against that particular person. So I, I see a means of us developing processes where um, we can provide more detailed information, more, or, uh, more organized information around registry data for rights protection processes and law enforcement processes. And at the moment, it's sort of an on and off switch. You're either getting nothing or you're getting everything. And the default has been that you get nothing because of GDPR and uh, privacy protection issues. We've sort of shut the taps on that. So I think Ford would have to develop a way as a registry of, of providing reasonable access to fairly comprehensive registry information. Uh, so that could assist law enforcement and rights protection processes. That's it in a nutshell from my perspective. It's not quite from the legal practitioner's perspective, but from an infrastructure and development perspective, I think um, we've made some headway, but we've encountered challenges as we go. Um, and, and I just wanna say one last thing, sorry to take your time. But I, I think the one clear thing that I've seen, uh, one good thing that I've seen in terms of the implementation of an ADR process in the ZA context, at least, is that we've also developed a pool of uh, domain name dispute resolution uh, um, experts, adjudicators. And I would like to see that practice continue within Africa as well, where we are developing local panels of experts to preside over these um, disputes, these ADR disputes that are lodged. And in doing so, they actually raise the, the awareness and the knowledge um, and the skills level around domain name dispute resolution. We've seen that development in South Africa and we have now 
over 40 specialist trademark attorneys that are also adjudicators in terms of some of these cases. That's it from my side. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, thank you very much, Neil, for that presentation. And um, I, I love the infrastructure question on how do we, you know, um, solve the infrastructure challenges. I especially like what you mentioned about the who is, um, you know, uh, feature right before GDPR and a lot of African countries coming in with data protection laws. Um, I don't know how efficient that is now with figuring out who owns a particular domain and how fast you could actually take action. Um, I, I don't know how that is playing out in South Africa. If there was an infringement, you know, uh, how long would it take me to know exactly who's behind that particular domain? Um, unlike what used to happen in the past. Could you maybe comment on that? Sure, so the process would be fairly manual at this point in time because of things like GDPR and in South Africa, we have PAPAYA, which is the Protection of Personal Information Act. And I'm sure you'll have something similar in, in, in Kenya and East Africa. There's, there's, there's all these um, rules around protection of information. But yeah, it would be manual. So you would have to approach the registry for a request to disclose that information on a access to information request basis. Uh, and that's very drawn out manual process. Um, it's not ideal. You need to find a way of trying to automate that process. And fortunately for us, ICANN is looking at um, uh, different protocols around how access to that information can be regulated. Um, so there's a, a new protocol that is um, uh, that is out at the moment that is replacing the WHOIS in, uh, protocol. It's called RDAP. Uh, I, I don't quite un, I know the, uh, the acronym, what it means, but uh, it's read data access protocol, I think it is. Uh, but that is going to be a new technical protocol that people can build on in order to provide different levels of access to who uh, to registry data. And I foresee that that's going to be the kind of the new standard all around the world, wherever there's a domain uh, a registry, and that would in time facilitate more automated controlled access to that data for rights protection processes. So think about it, you'd have a portal, you'd be able to do a check, uh, you've registered as a requester for this data already, so that part, the registry's got your credentials, and then that will allow you access into the registry data to do certain checks and maybe do what, what we would call registrant checks to see what other domain names are connected to that registrant and the like. So I see, I see technology being the solution at some stage in the future, but it's going to take a bit of time to evolve to that. Thank you very much, Neil, for that. And Bob Ocheng from ICANN uh, made a comment on the chat. It's a registration data access protocol at DAP. So thanks for bringing that, Neil. Um, and I'd also just want to encourage you to join the community that is ICANN. Um, ICANN does an amazing work in the regulation of, um, you know, on internet governance. And I think Bob will at some point make a few comments on how you could be part of the ICANN movement and to get together to um, have the internet governance, you know, working, especially around the domain Domain, domain names area. So thank you very much for that. We want to go to our next speaker who will build up on what Neil has spoken about and compared the, the current ecosystem to what's happening in South Africa. I like what you talked about on having you know, a panel of experts uh, that now we, you know, as attorneys, we need to get into dispute resolution around domains. And that's an opportunity that lawyers in the house, we could pursue um, to, you know, sort of increase Firstly, I think in terms of development, domains are a source of economic empowerment in whatever way, and that's how we sort of get, it, get into, the, into the space. Um, I'd want to encourage you to think loudly and chat on the chat function. If you have questions, which we already see some of the questions, please put them on the Q&A tab that's on your screen. Um, if you like us and you like something that was said on this particular panel, feel free to tweet about it so that people know that you know something. Um, so tweets and tag Kenick, um, TLD, tag ICANN, I C A double N, um, tag Lawyers Hub, Lawyers Hub Kenya, um, on whatever platform. And let's let's continue to engage um, on this particular discussion. Our next speaker is Beth Wanjiko. She's the chair um, of Kenic ADRP. She serves as an assistant system administrator at Kenya Network Information Center with seven years experience in the ICT industry. She currently also serves as a committee chair for Kenic Alternative Dispute Resolution Process. She holds a degree in business information technology from Strathmore University and is a certified mediator from Mediation Training Institute. Beth is passionate about internet governance and she'll be taking us through the Kenic domain name dispute process. Karibu Beth. Thank you, Linda, for that introduction. I know my mother is short, but in due time, you're going to build it. Maybe who knows next time I'll be the CEO of Kenic. 
stay to the point. Uh, as Kenic, we handle the local domain dispute process. But before we go there, oh, just a minute. What is Kenic about? Most people just say about Kenic, 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 but Kenic is an abbreviation of Kenya Network Information Center. We are a limited and licensed uh, company administered. Uh, manage, sorry, we are limited and we are limited and licensed to manage and administer the .ke domains. That is the country code top level domain. We facilitate the uptake and the growth of the .ke in the country. Just to mention that just last year, we hit the mark of 100,000 domains. Currently, we are at 100, 102, 700, which is quite commendable, considering that it, is, it has been quite a long journey. Kenic operates on a three-year model. That is the registry, in this case, Kenic. We have our registrars. The registrars, these are limited companies that have been accredited and licensed by Kenic to register domains for the end consumer. That is, in this case, the registrant. So the registrant is the owner of the domain. So why should you register a .k domain? One, uniquely Kenyan. We are all pushing the mantra of buy Kenya, build Kenya. Let's buy and push our own product. So once you have that online, online presence, it gives you the identity that you are uniquely Kenyan. Secondly, accessibility. A domain name is a, it's the gateway for you to have access to the internet. That is, a, and also it enhances business com competitiveness. So once you register that, it gives you access uh, to your customers to reach you and also know what products, what services you're providing. It also uh, gives credibility. Uh, your brand on the internet, it, it, it becomes credible because we all know as Kenyans or any other customers, they tend to visit sites that they can easily relate or know their source. Frequency of availability. If you are to, to go search for a domain right now, let's say for example, between .com and .ke, the probability of finding that a .ke is available, it's like 85% compared to any other generic domain name. And also when it comes to search optimization, it gives a brand uh, a higher search ranking locally based on the results. So uh, with due time, we've had so many domain disputes and it's through that that we thought Ken should have a policy to at least help with the process, not just uh, uh, a domain being registered and referring uh, a client or a complainant to the court, which I understand it's very, very expensive, it's tiring. So before we reach that stage, what does Kenic do? We provide that platform for you as a complainant and, uh, and a respondent to, uh, to, table your, to table your complaint and file it with us. So it was a policy that was adopted unanimously back uh, some time back to help settle uh, in your raising domain disputes around .ke, this was done in view of uh, like uh, evading things, not evading per se, but making the process easier without having to go to the court first. Uh, the policy highlights on the process to be followed by the complainant and the registrant. The complainant is the person who files the complaint with Kenic. And during the process, Kenic acts as a mediator meaning that we are a party that is neutral to both parties. We just help them to come up with a mutually acceptable agreement between the two parties. The two parties are also given a fair ground for them to air, uh, to air the, 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 the concerns they have. And then from there, we deliberate on the way forward. The decision making completely lies with the two parties. The process is voluntary. It's free, fair, and equitable for all parties. So how do we handle this process? The first step that we take, once a complaint, a complainant launches the dispute with us, the first thing we do is we do a voice check. 
who is, is, is who is information is the information that is uh, given to us or rather shared with Kenic through our registrars concerning a particular registrant. So the first thing we do, we check the who is to confirm if that domain belongs to that registrant, the owner of the domain. From there, we now schedule for the mediation. After the, 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 the registrant of the domain has given us feedback and confirmation that he or she is the owner of the domain. So once we start with the mediation process, we have three parties, that is Kenic, the complainant and the respondent. We also invite the registrar in some cases. So during that process, we get to hear the two parties. We give them a chance to tell us uh, what has been going on and what, has, what the complainant feels the registrant is infringing on. And after hearing the two parties, we give them options. There is the settlement. This is where they proceed and have a meeting outside mediation and decide on the way forward. In this case, uh, if the settlement, if the two parties agree to settle outside the mediation, the remedy will be either the domain is transferred, a domain is deleted, or a case is dis dismissed. In this case, it means that the respondent or rather the registrant remains with his or her domain. So what happens if the two parties do not agree? They proceed to arbitration. This is where Kenny provides them with a list of arbitrators and then they choose from the, the list and with whoever arbitrator they want to engage with and the charges involved. The arbitrator takes them through the whole process, which is also very fair. The arbitrator is not supposed to take sides with any of the parties. And it's usually between the arbitrator, the respondent and the complainant. So if the two parties and, the, and if the arbitrator helps them to come up with an agreement, the domain is transferred deleted or the case is dismissed. What happens if this does not also go through, if they do not agree, they proceed to litigation. And this is where they now proceed to court. The hearing continues. In all this process, Kenick is not involved. What we, we get now after that is a court order, ordering us to either transfer a domain, whether delete it or dismiss the case. That is the whole, that's how the whole process uh, goes about. But it's good that in most cases, complainant and respondent, or rather the parties are able to handle the, 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 the disputes at settlement level. So we barely have situations where the parties have to proceed to arbitration. But if they have to, Kenick facilitates much of it. That's it, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Beth, for that. Um, I think the process is very clear. I have a question before, before we proceed. What are the timelines between when the dispute is lodged with Kenick and when you call for mediation? How long does that take? Uh, the entire process at least takes approximately 14 to 21 days, but also yeah. it depends with the, the turnaround response from the complainant, the respondent, and any other parties involved. Because you find at some point, uh, there are challenges with communication. Some, some, some respondents take a bit long to respond, and also the complainant sometimes also take a bit longer to respond or rather to give reply. But in situations where we have uh, good communication, it takes a turn around 14 to 21 days. Don't you think like 14 days in the internet, you know, world is such a long time when there's an infringement? Yeah, it is. But again, uh, we have to give each party enough time to respond to what has been raised. Yeah. Yes. So that okay. the process can be clear for the two. Okay. Um, thank you very much. If anyone has a question for Beth, please post it on the Q&A tab. Um, if you have, um, you know, a domain, a .ke domain, uh, please, or your client has a .ke domain, the way to resolve that uh, dispute will be through Kenick. Um, and so Kenick will be taking a few of, of those questions as we proceed. Um, sorry, it's pretty uh, windy here. You will excuse us for a, a bit. Uh, but our next speaker, uh, we have two speakers who would um, go together, uh, but we have Donna uh, Van Bos. 
I, I, sorry, I will not pronounce your second name so that I just don't massacre it. Um, and then we also have Kenny who will be a, a accompanying Donna on this particular presentation. Donna will be talking um, and letting us know exactly what um, you know, contribution they would make. They are from Deloitte in Belgium and they will be making a presentation shortly. Uh, Donna, you ready to go? Meanwhile, if you have a comment, a question, please feel free to um, send a message to both panelists and attendees where you want to address everybody. If you just have a question, uh, please just uh, send it to the, to the panelist or put it on the Q&A tab. We will be taking your audio questions. Uh, once the next presentation is done, we'll ask you to raise your hand using the raise uh, hand feature and we'll enable your audio for you to be able to ask a question. If you're on social media, please look for Kenick LTD, look for ICANN, I-C-A-N-N, uh, AFTLD as well is on social media and Lawyers Hub Kenya. And if you want to you know, watch this a little later, maybe in a few days, um, you will be able to find it on Lawyers Hub Kenya YouTube channel. Please subscribe to our channel um, and you know, make us influencers or famous, whatever that is. Uh, but all this content is available um, on our YouTube channel a little later on. So we'd want to have Donna, you're ready to go? Please introduce yes. yourself um, and let sure. us know how to pronounce your second name as well. <laughs> sure. Um, hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Donna van Bosbeke. Uh, we're indeed based in Belgium, both uh, my colleague Kenny and myself. Uh, and we uh, indeed are from the, the Deloitte company, uh, but we are here uh, in the capacity of the Trademark Clearing House, uh, which is uh, an, an, uh, an, organi uh, um, an entity that we operate and uh, we do the validation services as uh, being Deloitte. Um, we do that for the Trademark Clearing House. So first of all, thank you everyone uh, for attending this webinar and taking this time. Very uh, interesting presentations uh, so far. And uh, Kenny and myself, we want to give you a brief overview of what the Trademark Clearing House is and uh, specifically some more guidance on our validation process. Uh, you can go to the next one, Kenny. Um, so the Trademark Clearing House, uh, or the TMCH, as we often call it, is a rights protection mechanism, uh, part of the new GTLD program from ICANN. And uh, in a nutshell, it is actually a centralized database of uh, authenticated and verified trademark information. Uh, and we connect with all of the new TLDs, uh, or top level domains, uh, that launch and come online. Um, in the clearinghouse, you can benefit from specific services that are only available to trademarks who have been verified by the TMCH. And uh, we are, uh, in that sense, a one-stop solution because of the fact that we connect with all of the new top-level domains uh, that launch uh, all in one central point. Next slide, please. Um, now, in order to get validated in the Team CH, it's of course important that you know which marks are allowed for inclusion in our database. Um, we have three different uh, categories, as we call it. Um, so the first one is the registered trademarks. And so those are uh, trademarks that are registered at uh, an IP office or a specific trademark office in, in, an, uh, in some of the jurisdictions. Um, and that has to be at least on a national level. So minimum country level um, IPOs, uh, those are eligible for inclusion. Then we have our second category, which are marks that are protected by a treaty or a statute. So that actually means that the mark is uh, being protected by a governmental law. And then our third category is court validated marks. So those are marks um, that have been validated by a court of law or by another uh, judicial proceeding. So those are the three types that we accept. And then we accept uh, trademarks from all over the world. Uh, so all jurisdictions are allowed, but at least on the national level. Uh, we do validations in all regions and also in all languages. And everybody there gets a, a, an equal service offering. So services are, are same for everyone. Um, and then your mark can, so the name as such, can consist out of letters, numbers, and also special characters. Um, Essentially, in the clearinghouse, we will state uh, whether the information that has been submitted into our system is accurate and is complete. And we do that by doing a one-on-one -on -one check with the information that we find in the uh, trademark offices of the different jurisdictions. Now, as a first step, you need to provide the intel of your trademark registration into the clearinghouse. Um, 
you can do this direct. So if you're if you're a brand owner, a trademark owner, you can do this directly yourself in a team stage. But you can also make use of our uh, trademark agents, and they then do the submission and the afterwards management for you and on your behalf. Um, we have uh, a lot of agents in the clearinghouse from all over the world, and uh, a list of, of those uh, agents you can also find on our on our public website, which we'll share uh, at the end of this presentation. Uh, some information that is being requested in the clearinghouse is, is, of course, the name of your trademark, but also details related to so who's the owner of the mark, uh, also related to niece classes, if that is applicable to your uh, jurisdiction, yes or no, um, also the goods and services for which your trademark is, is registered, um, and so on. Now, if you wish to benefit from our Sunrise service, which I'll explain at the, at the end of uh, the presentation, um, we also ask you to provide something that we call proof of use. Uh, proof of use consists out of two components. Uh, one is the signed declaration of use, which is basically a template that we ask you to uh, fill in, sign and, and upload into our system. Um, and it basically states that the information you have submitted in the TMCH and the um, sample that you have uploaded is accurate. Uh, and so the second component of that proof of use is in the sample, which is in essence um, a, a specimen that you need to upload to show the active use of your trademark. Uh, so that can be uh, numerous things. It can be a picture of your product where the trademark name is listed, or it can be uh, tags that are tagged along um, you know, the, the products if you sell something, for example, uh, or it could also be a screenshot of the website where the trademark name is mentioned. Um, just important to know there is that an exact match is needed. So if your trademark name would have a space, for example, then we also need to identify that space on your specimen of use. Um, also indicated there on the slide is that a proof of use is something that we revalidate every five years. Um, that's, that's something that has been uh, put as a requirement, um, that that's something that we do as a clearinghouse. Um, now, once all the information and documentation is submitted on your end, uh, then we will validate the information. Um, we do this by using a four eyes principle, what we call it. Um, so that means that every submission that is being included in the clearinghouse is that looked at by at least uh, two validators. Now, should these two have a different um, evaluation result, then a third validator is appointed to you know, analyze the information and documentation submitted and then to make um, a conclusion out of that. Um, some information fields that we check uh, are also listed on, on the slide on the, on the green banner uh, are, of course, again, the trademark name, but we'll also check the status of your registration and the expiry date because only valid trademark registration can be accepted. Um, also, at good services, ownership, um, or being validated on our end. So now maybe uh, good to know is how do we actually do this validation? Uh, that is actually dependent on the uh, jurisdiction that you're in. Why? Because some of the uh, jurisdictions where you can register trademarks have an online and searchable database where you can look up trademark registrations. If that is the case, then it actually suffices to submit the information in the clearinghouse and, and then you know, we can do the validation. If that's not the case, which we often see for, for African jurisdictions, that there's no uh, publicly available um, online searchable database, um, then we actually ask you to provide us with the trademark documentation. So that means the trademark certificate that has been issued by the office, uh, also potential renewal certificates, if that would be the case, uh, to actually provide that information. So to upload it into the clearinghouse so that we can, uh, of course, uh, um, you know, do our validation based on, on that intel. Um, I think for this one, yeah, let's indeed uh, can go to the next slide. Um, so once uh, the, the information is, is validated on our end, it could be that your um, submission was found incorrect. So that could mean, for example, that one of the, uh, the information fields that you included uh, contains the incorrect information or is maybe not complete. Uh, what happens then is that our validators provide you with detailed comments. Uh, to give you guidance on what you should correct and so in order that you can correct it and resubmit again uh, in order to get validated. Uh, we also have a support team available, uh, so they are always there to help you if you have questions on, on either validations, the TMCH services as such, but also any other topic that would relate to the TMCH. And then at some point uh, uh, when you're, you're um, completely validated, all the information is correct, 
um, we also do yearly checks uh, and that's uh, for data accuracy purposes. So to make sure that the information we have in our database is also uh, up to date uh, throughout the years. Okay. And then, um, of course, once you are validated in the TMCH, uh, its purpose is to benefit from certain services. Um, the main services of the clearinghouse, uh, and why we were initially established, is the Sunrise Service and the Claims Service. Uh, a Sunrise Service um, offers you priority registration during the sunrise period of a TLD, which is 30 to 60 days, depending on uh, that's something the TLD chooses themselves. Um, and by being validated in the clearinghouse, you actually receive a token and that token you can use to then register your preferred um, domain name in that TLD uh, before the TLD opens up to the, the wide public. Um, once the, the TLD does go into general availability, what we call, so it opens up to the wild world, if you can say it. Um, then we have our claims service, which is offered during a 90 day period. And it's um, a warning and a notification service. The warning part of it means that if a, if a person or a company wants to register a domain name that includes your trademark, which has been verified by the TMCH, then that registrant will get a notice. So they actually get a, a warning message to say, hey, uh, the name that you want to register is actually uh, contains a verified trademark. And so only uh, if the, the at that moment during that notice, the registrant gets the possibility to either proceed with their registration or to cancel it. Now, if they would decide, okay, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and I want to register this domain name, then you, so that's the second part of the service, you as the owner of the trademark will then receive a notification uh, from the clearinghouse to inform you of the fact that a domain name has been registered, uh, including your trademark. And uh, that then gives you, uh, you know, you get the intel and then based on that, you can evaluate whether that domain name is indeed infringing your rights and, and, and what the potential actions are that you can undertake in order to, uh, to protect your brand online. Um, that's um, was it mainly from our side. I know it's, it's very quick and maybe pretty high level, uh, but we're, both Kenny and I are, are very happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, so feel free. Uh, to let anything know in the chat or either, uh, in the Q&A, sorry, or, um, uh, you know, maybe take the mic afterwards, not sure how, uh, how it's gonna be organized. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much, Donna. Uh, thank you, Donna, for the presentation. I personally learned a lot from your presentation and I see um, the role that you play is actually to have this sort of notification um, that, you know, you, someone is infringing on your trademark, this is what you need to do. Um, and the service is global. So that means that I don't necessarily have to, you know, look at every registry in whatever country that has registered, you know, um, a domain that is, you know, actually related to, to the trademark that I own or someone else owns. Um, yeah. So thank you very much for that particular presentation. I would want to maybe just ask the, <laughs> the difference between Deloitte and uh, the trademark clearing house. <laughs> um, um, I, I don't know how that sort of plays in, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Um, so basically, the Tremor Clearinghouse, as I uh, mentioned in the beginning, is a, is one of the right protection mechanism that was built during the uh, uh, during uh, for the ICANN New GTLD program. So what happened yeah. is that the ICANN community basically, um, you know, they decided they wanted to have a clearinghouse, and at that moment. Um, someone needed to operate the clearinghouse and so you know an, an rfp was sent out and then we as deloitte uh deloitte belgium um were part of that and uh, we essentially uh, now do the validation part of uh, the trademark clearinghouse so we're the validation service provider okay thank you very much for that donna uh, if you have any Welcome. questions for donna please use the q a tab um, the panelists have been keeping their eyes on the Q&A tab. Some of them have been answered privately, uh, but we'd be happy to, you know, check the next set of questions. Uh, I'd want to ask if you learned anything, please let us know in the chat as well. We'd love for you to at least rub our ego, Lawyers Hub, ICANN, Kenick, as well as AFTLD, to let us know that this has been useful, um, even as we continue to check the, the questions. If you have a question uh, right now, please raise your hand. Um, we'll be able to allow you to ask the question. I think I'll start from my classmate, that's Stella Musembi, who's an advocate. Uh, Stella, please proceed. Okay, Stella. 
thank you, Linda, for giving me this opportunity. Mine is actually not a question, but just to say that it, this, this is an important learning curve for all of us. And uh, we'll be interested in knowing more on ICANN. And um, thanks, thanks for putting this together. Much, much appreciated. Thank you very much, Stella Musembi. Uh, thanks for the kind words. And ICANN would be making a comment at the end of this particular webinar on how you could engage with the community. It's a global community that you should all join. Uh, Aluso Ingati is saying, I'm loving the content. Thank you very much. Alex Kanyi says, Beth, please give us a high profile on the process of registering domains in Kenya. And so that's a question for Beth. Um, we now have, uh, I think, the next um, sort of comment. If you have a question, continue to put up your hand and we'll be able to have you speak. Um, we have, I think, on the Q&A tab, how we'll go through this section is we'll have all the questions together and then give the panelists um, an opportunity to answer the question and make their final remarks. And then we'll have the remarks from the partners. So I'd ask the panelists to you know, uh, take note of the questions that have been asked um, here. Uh, there's a question about, um, I think if you could just scroll a little bit up on um, uh, Joyce Kibet. Um, question to Donna, how has the fast transition to the online marketplace due to COVID-19 pandemic increased or reduced trademark application traffic to the clearinghouse? That's a good question. Um, an anonymous attendee is asking, is the service by trademark clearinghouse free? Um, we also have Nathan M who's asking, where do most of these disputes come from? Is it failure for original owner to renew after entire grace period before deletion? Um, thanks very much for that. Um, I think there's a, there's a question by Masio Kiro that I've sort of lost. Um, a few other questions, if we go up on some of the questions I think that would uh, benefit everyone. Some of them have been answered privately. Um, we have somebody asked about um, just a little bit up, sorry, um, uh, anonymous person asks, with the understanding that uh, trademarks enjoys territorial application, what is the easiest avenue through which one can obtain trademark protection regionally or even wider, say in the whole of the EU and Africa, instead of going country to country, is there an organization that works towards such? I found WIPO to be limited, especially in Africa. Uh, Daniel will take that question. Um, and then uh, Lawrence J here is asking, Beth, can you break down costs to expect at every point of the dispute process? Um, and uh, Tom Nyagari makes a comment and says, I'm an arbitrator, mediator, and principal IP consultant at Thinkly IP. We have excellent presentations here. Facilitators are excellent, and Linda is doing a good job. My own observation is that there's a huge knowledge and awareness gap out there. IP services, importance of IP and IPR and IP dispute resolution are jargons out there. Business community needs serious awareness campaigns on what, what IP rights are and how to protect those particular rights. So those are some of the questions. We'll take our final you know, audio question. If you want to ask um, a question, please just look for the raise hand feature um, and we'll be able to unmute you to speak um, right now. Uh, there are a few, I think 19 more questions that we I think have been answered privately um, and uh, the, the panelists will be able to you know, uh, point out a few of this uh, highlight a few of these particular questions. So we have, I think, three minutes for each and every panelist to, you know, answer the question that came in um, and then be able to make their closing remarks. We have Ruth Nduta, who is um, in communication marketing and is asking what recourse is there for people who hijack your social media accounts and websites demanding for payment. Um, so I think that would be important to on the domains that are actually social media domains. Um, and our platforms in that, in that particular regard. Is there any question that we missed out? I think we'll go as we started and uh, we'll start with uh, Daniel. So if you could just put together the questions that have been addressed to you, uh, put them together and then also make your closing remarks, how people could get in touch with you um, and how we could engage. Daniel? Great, uh, thank you. Um, I'll first address the question uh, which is with the understanding that Trademarks enjoys a territorial application. What is the easiest avenue through which one can obtain a trademark protection regionally or even wider, say in the whole of the EU and Africa, instead of going country to country is an organization that works towards such. So um, it, it, it is a bit of an issue, but there are regional uh, ways of protecting your mark. There's an EU trademark, which covers all the EU member states. So that's an option. Within Africa, there are organizations called a repo. Um, that is Southern African countries where you can get uh, regional protection and ORP, which is the French African speaking countries where you can cover a few countries with one application. So there are 
um, options over there um, from that. And it would be good to consult uh, lawyers um, in those particular uh, regions uh, within that. Um, on the domain name side of things, um, I just want to see if there are um, specific domain name questions, if you can maybe assist if there's any that I've missed. Um, I'm just looking to see. Um, oh, yeah, okay, there's one that says, where most of these uh, disputes come from, is it a failure for the original owner to renew a domain after the entire grace period before deletion? So domain name disputes um, arise in various forms. The one is, like you say, where someone forgets to renew the domain and snapped up by someone who holds it to ransom and wants to sell it back. That's the one part. The other part is the failure to secure your domain name at uh, the relevant opportunity. So say you're expanding to Tanzania and you want to register a CO.TZ domain or even in Kenya, and you fail to do that in time, someone could snap that up and then you have to go through a dispute resolution process. So it's also opportunists. It doesn't necessarily mean that you've forgotten to register. And also with all these new GTLDs that have come out, you know, we've assisted a lot of trademark owners securing domain names in various jurisdictions and there are various me mechanisms available, but the easiest and the most cost effective is to be proactive. So I know Linda, you said that you have over 200 domain names. That, that, that's very good to hear. I think domain name portfolios always increase over time as you become more proactive in the name space. Um, so I would say the cheapest option is to make sure you secure the relevant ones for you uh, within the countries where you trade or intend to trade. Um, and then I just see a general question here that says, what is the place of AI in the space that is solving domain name disputes? I wish there was an AI solution. What we do have and what we offer trademark lawyers um, and big brands is um, the opportunity to monitor their particular trademark within over a thousand TLDs. So if anyone registers something identical or confusingly similar, for instance, Google instead of Google, you would be notified of this and then you can decide what action to take. But I do think there's a big problem facing um, domain name disputes and domain name recovery. And that is what Neil touched on is the GDPR. A lot of the information on the who is record is redacted. So that means is you, you don't know who's registering these domain names. They're hiding behind this, um, 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 I'd say layer of privacy that was introduced by the EU and all countries are adopting and adhering to now. While I think it's very good to protect privacy, I think from an IP perspective, it's very difficult because you cannot find out who is registering domain names. In the past, you could um, do a register on name searches so you could find out if a, a person is a serial squatter, are they registering multiple domain names, um, targeting different trademark owners. This would assist in recovering domain names, but these days you don't really know. You have to kind of take bits and pieces and try and put it together to find out who's infringing upon a particular trademark. Um, I just want to see if there are any other questions uh, specifically to, to domain names. Um, um, one person asks about the, the grace period. Um, well, every um, normally the grace period is set by the registry and it depends on, I think most registrars have to adhere to the grace period set by a registrar. Um, and um, what should happen is when a domain name expires, it should stop operating. So if you have any services attached to it, there should be an interruption and that should alert you to, um, uh, to renew your domain. Where our services really come in is that um, it helps a, uh, we help businesses and law firms um, to make sure that these domain names don't lapse, that your domain names are set on auto renew, that there's no oversight that for instance, your IT manager forgets to renew a domain name or um, credit card details change so that the domain names aren't renewed and then deleted. You need to look after them comprehensively in a centralized manner and in a coordinated manner. And that's where we really assist um, law firms and, and, and big brands to kind of align their domain names in the same way as which you manage your trademarks. So for instance, you'd go to a trademark lawyer to manage your um, trademarks the same as you'd go to a professional trademark brand protection company to make sure that you're comprehensively protected there. Um, then I just want to see if there are any other questions. I know there's reference to an article. I don't have time to read that article to answer the questions, but if you want to reach out to me, my email address is daniel at lexsynergy.com. I can answer a variety of domain name disputes and, and brand protection questions, anything that may go beyond um, this particular 
um, webinar or any questions not um, answered. Um, what I can answer is one question with the Trademark Clearinghouse. Um, sorry to step on any toes there, Donna, but um, we're a Trademark Clearinghouse agent, so we just do submit trademarks for validation. Um, there is a cost involved, and it depends on um, how many years you want your mark validated for, one, three, or five years. Every trademark clearinghouse agent has a different cost. Um, we would advise going, uh, going through a trademark clearinghouse agent and not directly due to um, the cost saving, as well as making sure that it's submitted in the correct way so you can get a speedy validation. I think I've addressed those. I, I know I do speak quickly sometimes and uh, cover quite a few areas. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel. Uh, that was very, very useful. We really appreciate your work from Lex Synergy. Uh, please get in touch with Daniel if you have any particular questions. We also want to encourage you to connect with him on social media as well. He's on Twitter, he's on LinkedIn. Um, and I just want to ask Daniel if you could um, type your email again on the chat for those who would you know, benefit from, from the same. Um, I like the, what's going on in the chat, even in terms of the questions. I'd ask the media team to just maybe show us the answered questions because there's a lot of questions that were answered on the background. Um, if there's a way in which we could all have access to the answered questions, I think that would also be useful. Um, I, there's a great comment by, um, I think on the chat, by Hagreeves who says that many people um, many organizations actually use the IT guy to register their domains. And these IT people use their personal emails to register for this domain. And so when they leave the organizations, they refuse to release these particular domains and then they get into these disputes. Um, so I think that's a lesson to all of us. If you own a domain, ensure that you own it uh, with your own email, an email that is accessible to you, that you'll be able to get reminders on when you can renew. Um, I think we have domains with the most of the you know, uh, country level, uh, you know, uh, registrants, and um, they sent SMSs that it's about to expire. They also sent you an email. And so please ensure that that is actually in your name. So I grieve Standard, thank you very much for that particular comment. Um, and so we'll go to the next um, panelist, Neil, who will um, continue to ask, answer the questions directed to him, and then also make his closing remarks. Neil? Thanks. Um, there weren't really many direct questions, but uh, just a sort of summary of what I was saying earlier, and that is um, that I think development of an ADR process has multiple um, benefits for a namespace like KE. Uh, the one is obviously that it does provide a mechanism to uh, or a process that is cost effective and efficient to um, preside over the um, over domain disputes. But at the same time, what uh, my experience has been is that it's also provided a, a great foundation in order to develop the knowledge around domain names and domain dispute resolution, especially amongst the legal community. So um, in the South African context, when ZEDA at least, we've seen over the last 13, 14 years, we've seen this development of, this, uh, of a specialist domain name practice within the existing legal fraternity and then mechanisms for people to share their skills and uh, the case the case law that is developed around domain disputes. So there's a lot of attention paid to previous decisions and the nuances of the legal arguments and the factual questions. And it's created a whole new forum of legal practice. Um, and that is in, in turn, that has also meant that lawyers become more sensitized and aware of domain names and the role they play in business and they can advise their clients uh, better. Um, and, and I think that it, you need something like an ADR mechanism and, and a well-organized, localized ADR mechanism to, to foster that sort of buy-in and that support of the local, uh, of the local legal community. Uh, when it came to, for instance, the ADR process for ZA, we've made extensive use of um, trainee adjudicators. So we've found ways of pairing senior people who have been, become part of our adjudication panels, pairing them with juniors, junior legal practitioners, to pick up the skills and the know-how of how to preside over domain disputes, to get them involved in the domain name um, um, legal processes. And we found that to be a pretty useful process of actually transferring skills and developing capacity within the panels of expert that we've, uh, that we've created yeah, and that preside over matters on an ongoing basis. I think it was a fairly unique solution to um, a, a very, fairly unique situation in, in that we have South Africa and that when you look at something like the UDRP, you don't really have that on the job type of training process. So I think it was an African solution for an African problem and, um, and it's worked pretty, pretty well in ZA. 
And then as time has progressed, we've found ways to evolve the ADR process um, so that it keeps track with um, uh, the current practices and, and the like. So we've, for instance, introduced a concept of summary decision uh, into the ADR process, which basically means, uh, and, I, and I mentioned this in my initial talk, and that is that when you're filing a complaint and you're not getting a response, um, you still have to go through the whole process of getting to a decision. And, that's, and that could be fairly within the realm of ADR, that could be fairly costly and time consuming. So um, the regulator has introduced the concept of a summary decision. And it basically now says that if you don't care to file a response to a complaint, that an adjudicator can be appointed um, immediately and the adjudicator can make a decision based just on the complaint in a, in a summary manner. In other words, just a, on a prima facie case, they can decide to transfer the domain name. And we've seen that that process has been pretty um, popular and widely used by the adjudicators in the last two years since it was introduced. So you can see an evolution of the ADR process and the way in which these things are approached. And then lastly, the only other thing that we're sort of playing around with at the moment, and it ties into one of the questions about what happens to a domain name when it, uh, when it goes to an ADR, is it suspended or anything like that? It points towards urgency. A lot of these cases are based on some degree of urgency because the domain name was used for some critical infrastructure or service. It's then registered by a, a third party and a dispute arises. Um, and one thing that we're seriously looking at in terms of ZA is some sort of uniform rapid response or rapid suspension process mm. that can cater for those critical, you know, those really, really important instances where you want to suspend the operation of the domain name. Failing that, the domain name continues to operate until the dispute is presided. But but the URS type of process in ZA and I think in, in Kenya as well, that you know, th those could be very useful. And that's yeah. it from my side. I don't think there's anything else. Thank you very much for that, Neil. How do we get in touch with you? I'll type uh, my email in the chat. Okay, thank you very much. And the team here um, um, suspects that they follow you on Instagram. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so please drop your Instagram handle for um, the team at the Lawyers Hub. Uh, I, I hear there's a lot of activity happening there. Um, and we want to beg you to follow us on Instagram as well, Lawyers Hub Kenya. And I'm looking for all the followers as well, Linda Bonio on, on Instagram. If you follow me, I'll be famous and I'll remember you guys. Um, so our next sort of um, question now goes to Beth um, from Kenick and um, Beth will be answering your questions. I think there's been very several questions. We have, um, you know, people who own the .ke domains. And I think maybe now it's clear on the country level domains and the top level domains, the difference. Maybe you could just talk about that again so that people get to know the difference between the type of domains and then get to the questions that have been asked before. Beth, the floor is yours. Thank you, Linda, for that. Uh... Uh, to answer some of the questions, one of the questions that I've received is the cost breakdown on uh, the whole process, ADRP process. Currently at Kenick, mediation is free, but from uh, the arbitration process of it, it's usually between the arbitrator and the respondent and the complainant. So we have no control over the prices they're going to agree. The litigation and the arbitration, that is not between the parties involved and the, the, the arbitrators are or other at the court level. The next, the next question was about the registration processes for a domain. So the first thing, if you wish to register a domain, like it was mentioned earlier, identify a domain, a domain that is short and memorable in such a way that if you are to register it and to, you are to share it with people out there, they will be able to identify and remember with a particular domain. So once you identify the domain you want to register, the next step is check its availability. We have a whois check on our website, kenik.or.ke, so you can look it up. Once you know that your domain is available, the next thing is contact one of our licensed and accredited registrars. We also have that list on our website, kenik.or.ke. Most of them offer different packages, depending on what you as an individual want. So you just contact them and uh, it's going to direct them mostly to their website and show the prices of what they have to offer. The last thing, make sure that the information under your domain is correct. Just like it has been highlighted, most people do not check the information that has been registered. Now you find disputes arise from that. So make sure that your contact name, your email address, your phone number, 
reads your identity. So that in case of a problem, we as the registry can be able to reach out to you. And I guess uh, the other thing was the kind of domain extensions that Kenya, uh, Kenya offers. We have .co.ke, that is for organizations, for companies. We have .or.ke, .or.ke is for NGOs. We have .sc.ke, that one is for primary school, kindergartens, that, that one is for the lower institutions, kindergartens, uh, primary school, high school. And then we have .ac.ke, that one is for technical institutions, the university, the Tibet institutions. And for the schools, you must provide either a registration certificate from Tibet or Ministry of Education. In case you do not have a certificate, give us a letter of approval from either Tibet or Ministry of Education. We also have uh, .me.ke, that one is for personal uh, domains, like probably best.me.ke. We have .ne for networks. We have .mobi also, but we barely use that. But the, the, the majority ones are the ones that I've mentioned. My parting shot is, uh, let's promote our own, let's register domains. That is the gateway to the internet. So make sure you register a .ke domain. They support. We also have all the procedures outlined for Kenic from Kenic side to handle any kind of challenges or anything related to .ke domains. We are here to support you. So feel free to contact us. You can reach me through Beth at Kenic. We also have the support email admin at kenic.org.ke. Buy Kenya, build Kenya. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that, Beth. And um, uh, we are supporters of uh, .ke. You know, we, we use the .ke domain for several of our, of our domains. And so I encourage you to own a .ke. I like the .me, .ke. Please have a personal website that you tell people all the stuff that you want to tell that maybe your employer does not allow you to, to do. Um, so you can have your personal domain, uh, register that today, and you'd, you'd be happy. Get a .com as well. Um, uh, we have been trying as a family to get the bonyo.com and it's, I don't know what other family is fighting with us for the dot bonyo, you know, uh, dot com domain. Um, so the earlier you can get these domains, the better for your brand and also for dot Africa as well. Dot Africa is really good and most of them are also available. Um, so the final question will go to uh, both Kelly. Um, and, and, and Donna, we still have a session for this, for those who want to engage. ICANN will be making a few comments at the end, as well as the CEO from Kenick, as well as Barack from AFTLD. Um, and so Donna and Kelly, I think you can proceed with the questions. <laughs> yes, okay. thank you. Thank you, Linda. Hi. Um, yeah, we, re we received a couple of questions. Um, one was on a... Um, a question around the numbers due to you know the increase of you know registered domain names due to the COVID pandemic. Um, we see the numbers in the Kramer Clearing House rather stable, um, but considering the fact that the number of trademarks and as well as the number of the domain names are increasing um, and also indeed exponentially, uh, and the that will make sure that the abuse will also increase. Uh, we do anticipate that the interest in the trademark learning house will uh, will continue to increase as well, um, and that for the next few months and years. So we we do anticipate that there will be an increase in records in the DMCH. Um, I think also uh, there was a, a question that was already answered by Daniel from Lex Energy. Um, indeed, so there is a cost associated with um, um, being included in the trademark learning house, and. We, from our side, actually also anticipate that you know it's best to go by an agent because we do see that you know it, it's much more efficient and cost efficient uh, for for you to do so. Um, I don't know if there were any other questions or things that you wanted to raise, Donna. You're still. No. Me. Yeah. No, I think we we have it. The specific questions covered. Um, in, in any case, anyone can reach out to us via uh, hello at uh, trademarkclearinghouse.com. Um, we also have our marketing website, which we're, we're happy to share as well. And then they can always reach out to us via there as well. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Kelly. And thanks, Donna, as well, uh, from the Trademark Clearinghouse based in uh, Belgium. Um, thank you for joining us as well today. And I hope you learned something. There's been additional questions on the Q&A tab. We'll try and put them together and see what, you know, uh, what information we could get from our speakers as well as the partners uh, once this is done. But in terms of community and getting together, we'd love to get our partners on board. Um, this webinar was not um, run by one partner, but we had ICANN, Lawyers Hub, FTLD, as well as Kenick uh, getting together to get you today. And I'm so grateful that we've had over 300 people joining us on this particular webinar. And we just want to have, um, our partners come together to let us know how do we engage, how do we become part of ICANN, how do we engage with Kenick? And we have a really great question for Masio Kiro, who's asking, how do I join the panel, uh, the dispute resolution panel at Kenick? Um, so I think we'd, uh, there are also people who want to be accredited as well. I'm not sure we have lawyers who are actually accredited to register domains um, as it is now. And so I'd first, um, you know, get Bob um, on, on board. Um, do we have Joel as well? Um, and Joel, I'm going to register the .me.ke for Bonio uh, because our entire family, our success is pegged on that Bonio domain. <laughs> so Bob, come um, on board and uh, Joel and also Barack, um, if we could all join um, right now, we'll be able to answer the questions that we have right now. Uh, please save the, the links that have been shared on the chat. They are really important. Even if you can't go to them right now, uh, take the time to, you know, to engage. I'd also just want to appreciate Aluso Ingati, who is the chair of the Law Society of Kenya um, on IT and IP. We have a committee that is doing well. Um, and so we'd really appreciate you coming on board as well. Um, and so I think we'll begin from Bob and then go to Joel um, and then, uh, with Bar then Barak. So Bob, um, please proceed. Uh, thank you very much, Linda, and I hope you can hear me. I'll be quite quick, uh, noting that we are actually uh, out of time already. Uh, first of all, I must really thank our panelists. I think this has been a very informative session, and uh, I'm sure our participants would agree uh, that indeed uh, this is one topic or one knowledge area that uh, you know is, is somewhere kept in the background, but uh, more and more, and especially during this pandemic period, uh, it has come to the forefront, but uh, really the question of trademark and bank protection is is so important. And uh, if you you know you you, you bring it uh, or you are to relate it to the domain, and then you realize a whole industry, you know, a whole industry uh, that 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 uh, needs this service. Uh, and you have participants from you know different sectors. And here I mean you know you have lawyers here and you have people in the tech space. And uh, sometimes the question of disputes, uh, especially in this area, makes them meet uh, at a point of either either defending uh, or, or prosecuting each other. So this was really an opportunity for these two teams, you know, these broad teams of uh, those, those in the legal sector and the DNS industry to meet in a session where they can talk uh, harmoniously. And I hope that uh, that has been achieved. Uh, I do note that uh, it is not very easy to clear this or to finish this in a one and a half hour session, but it was really to also uh, help us know where to start. Should we have an issue? Where should we go to? You know, uh, where is Kenny? Who should I contact in Kenny? And also to highlight the different players in the ecosystem. You know, for example, the trademark clearing house. Uh, these are facilities that are available uh, for use, and they do provide uh, critical services. And most of the time, uh, these services are not known to the industry. So, uh, looking at this and uh, and 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 and, and uh, uh, linking it to what we, we, we the ideas we had at the inaugural. Uh, you know, Legal Innovation Week that was held in November, we realized that this particular area you know, needed greater focus and probably a more dedicated timing and, 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 and sessions to, to, to keep learning and uh, to promote awareness in this particular area. And I hope that uh, it has been worth your while uh, in this uh, session. So we hope that we, you know, you can reach us uh you know with whatever feedback you have gotten from this as participants if you need us to organize further sessions around this i'm sure kenick and 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 of course lawyers hub and aftld and the partners today are are, are, are very willing to do follow-up sessions you know could be better targeted you know could be more focused on a particular area within this particular domain 
to keep us uh, engaged and uh, to keep highlighting the relevant information that we need. Uh, so I think with those few remarks, uh, should you need to reach us specifically at ICANN, I have uh, put our contacts on the chat, feel very free to, uh, to do so. Otherwise, I want to thank all the panelists so far and the organizers for putting this together and I hope it has been worth your while. Uh, thank you very much, Linda, and back to you. Thank you very much, Bob, and thank you for making this happen as well as one of the partners. Um, ICANN has been a good friend of the Lawyers Hub, and we are looking forward to your support at the Africa Law Tech Festival that's happening in July this year. I'd urge you to you know, uh, sign up, go to africalawtech.com, and we'll be talking about uh, some of these issues as well, together with ICANN and our partners. And, and now, too, we go to Kenik. There's been questions on how do I become a registrar? Um, and also, how do I, you know, um, how do I join a panel? Uh, and these are the questions from the lawyers. With us is the CEO of Kenick, uh, Mr. Joel Carubio. Uh, please proceed. Hi, Linda. Hi, everyone. Uh, good day. Um, thank you. Thank you for conducting this uh, this webinar today. I think it's it's quite uh, informative for us. I think is just to thank first the panelists for accepting to be on this panel and giving their insightful views around this. Uh, there are a couple of questions that have been asked and I think um, they're a bit long, so we'll not be able to address them because of the time, but how to become a registrar and the rest. Um, we've put in our email address, admin at kenic.or.ke. Please reach out and we can give you the process, although it's also on our website. So you can actually go in there and see what the process is to become a registrar. Uh, the, for me, just two comments I'd like to make as to why this, uh, this webinar was put together. One, we know the role and the, and the very important role that lawyers play in terms of business registration, uh, making sure that someone is getting their business registered, business name searches. Um, so what we wanted also is just to bring out the aspect of once you look at your business registration process, a domain name is part of a business registration process. So once you're advising your clients around what business name they should have, how to search for it when you go to BRS, also then look at um, encouraging them to get their domain name and their trademark also um, put in all that package. So it's part of that um, business registration process that we are encouraging that a domain name is part of that conversation. And for us in Kenya, a .ke is the domain name that we advocate that you get. Um, there's someone who asked something about the Data Protection Act. Yes, that is on our table now. We've actually started looking at some of the aspects around it in terms of how we are taking care of data of domain of domain and registrants. And we have a document in place which we are sharing and uh, collaborating with the data commissioner. And that should be out very soon in terms of how you will know that your data is protected and ensuring that uh, if anything changes within your data, how as Kenick the registry is taking care of that. And obviously last as both, Beth has uh, very elaborately done about dispute resolution. We are here for you. If you have any challenges, if you feel that someone, I know some people commented how can we block domain names? If you feel that there's an issue, if you feel someone is infringing on you, reach out to us, we are here for you. That's why we are the registry, that's why we are here. Uh, so we can be able to support you in that role. So last but not least, uh, please Kenyans, buy your Kenyan domain name, .ke, there are various extensions that speak to your brand and we shall be able to help you get online. Thank you very much, Linda, and to all the panelists and everyone that has attended today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Joel Carubio is the CEO at Kenick, and I agree with him. Um, please buy a .ke domain. When you do a search locally, that will come to, you know, it will be ranked, you know, up uh, on local on local searches, which is very important for your local clients. And you can buy the .africa domains as well, you know, sort of merge them together so that they all point towards one particular address, and that will be cool. So our final um, comment will be from Mr. Barak. Um, Tieno, who's from Africa, uh, AFTLD. I don't know whether Mr. Barak, you're here. I'm not able to see you. Um, that will be the final, I think, uh, yeah. comment. Yes, Barak, just in, in two minutes, and then we'll wrap this up. Thank you very much, Linda, for the excellent moderation, and uh, to all our partners and uh, panelists uh, who have indeed uh, made very excellent presentations. There's a lot to be done in this space as some of the participants have uh, rightly highlighted on the chat uh, we are barely scratching the surface uh, but having said that i want to recognize uh, some of the participants that are not from kenya as you noticed about 80 percent were from kenya 16 percent were from other african countries 
including a country called Top Level Domain Managers who have joined us uh, to learn and also to um, hear some of the issues that are of common concern across the continent. So just to emphasize on what Joel has said, uh, the role of a country called Top Level Domain Registries cannot be under, cannot be overemphasized. When we buy local domains, we build the local internet community. So I want to just encourage us, buy in Kenya, buy across the African continent uh, for the betterment and improvement of the African uh, continent. Otherwise, Africa Top Level Domains Organization is a regional association for country called Top Level Domain Registries uh, in the Africa region. Uh, we have uh, three other such organizations covering Europe, Latin America, and the Caribbean, and uh, Asia Pacific. And uh, more than 80% of the total domains registered globally are resident within the European territory. So there is plenty to be done in Africa. And I think this is an opportunity uh, even for us who are lawyers majority on this call also to become resellers for domain names. So with that, I thank you. Uh, I thank the team that was behind this and um, we hope to meet you in the next uh, webinar. Thank you very much, Linda. Thank you very much, Barak. And you are right, people are asking for the next webinar. We have Bernard Geno and, and Benedict as well, who are asking for a technical session um, for this particular topic. And I hope that we can put this together. I would want to you know, thank RISPA from the Lawyers Hub, who uh, worked together with Vincent from Kenick uh, behind the scenes. We really appreciate the work that you have done. I also want to thank the media team here, the Lawyers Hub, Ken and Luisa. Thank you very much for making this happen today, um, as well as Charles, we sincerely appreciate. And to the four partners that have made this happen, FTLD, ICANN, Kenick, and the Lawyers Hub, we just wanna say thank you to our panelists. We really appreciate you, Daniel, uh, Neil. Um, we also I want to appreciate you as well, Beth, um, for coming in today, as well as Kelly, um, and Donna uh, from the Trademark Clearing House. We really, really appreciate. And we want to ask you, please join the Lawyers Hub, join ICANN, join this particular organizations, including Kenick, engage with Kenick. That way you'll be, you know, um, you'll have information, you'll have access, and you'll be able to know how exactly to engage. I like the closing remarks by Joel, where he said that let's consider trademark um, registration as well as domain name uh, registration as business registration services that we give our clients as lawyers. Let's also own some domains, own the local domains, get them now. Um, sometimes we wonder where our parents were in the 70s as everyone bought land in Nairobi and apartments in South Africa. We also, your children will wonder why you don't own specific domains because the domains I believe uh, you know, we'll continue, even trademarks will continue to be, you know, more and more, um, you know, valuable as, as the days go, go by. There's so, so many questions we were not able to answer today, but we just want to appreciate you for coming in. Um, you can visit lawyershub.org. It has all the information you need. Um, we have an accelerator for startups. If you're a startup and want to know more around intellectual property and how that can help your business and anything around the law, whether you're a law startup or you're a tech startup, please um, go to lawyer lawyershub.org, you'll be able to get that particular information. This recording is going to be available on the ICANN website, on the Kenick website, um, as well as on the Lawyers Hub YouTube page. Um, so if you want to watch it and want to share with it, please uh, go in and, um, and, and log in on those particular three um, channels that will be able to watch it. We're also still begging you to follow us on Instagram um, so that we can get to many more followers. We'd be happy if you could follow Lawyers Hub Kenya um, on all your social media channels. If you want to still engage on LinkedIn, find Africa Law Tech. It's a community that you should join to talk about Africa law and technology. You can connect with me as well on LinkedIn, Linda Bonio, on all particular platforms. Um, thank you very much for this particular webinar. I hope you had a good time. And thanks for, I think Sergio from Mozambique, thanks for joining this particular webinar today and everyone who joined across the continent. We really appreciate all the partners and what you've learned today. If you wanna leave a nice message, please let us know on the chat. Uh, we'll be finishing the, clearing the chat just in a few, in a few minutes. Um, and it will lead you to you know, our social media channels. Please like, share the YouTube channel, share the feedback, tweet about something you learned today so that people in your network know that their lawyer knows what's happening across, you know, on issues around domain and, and technology. And for Kenyans who are working from home, 
we hope that you, you know, um, you have a, a great time. You have some mental support around you because not having a community when you're working from home is not, is not easy. Kids are home. Uh, we hope that you will be able to, you know, engage within a community to have some sort of mental health. Take a walk, take calls when you're, you're walking around so that you, you know, you're still sane um, until this particular lockdown ends. And to, you know, Zede and those in Belgium, thank you for joining us. Have a good time from the Lawyers Hub, from ICANN, from AFTLD and Kenick. We want to thank you. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye.